Bienvenue, Madame la Ministre. Welcome to New York virtually. Over to you, Minister. I think you remain on mute, Minister. See you. There we go. You hear me now? <laughs> yes, yes very great. clear. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, Catherine, for this wonderful introduction. Well, Mr. Richard Kaufman, Chair of General Capital and Adjunct Senior Research Scholar of the Columbia Center of Global Energy Policy. Monsieur Pierre-Olivier Pinault, Professeur titulaire au Département de Sciences de la Décision à HEC Montréal. Monsieur Hugues Girardin, Vice-président du Développement chez Boralex. Mr. Dallas Bertrand, Senior Fellow at Resources of the Future. Ms. Catherine Nouvier, Délégué général du Québec à New York. Bonjour et merci pour cette belle invitation. Bonjour à tous les invités présents. Je suis heureuse d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui, car le sujet dont il est question et les activités de la Climate Week, dans leur ensemble, abordent des sujets cruciaux et actuels. Nous sommes tous ébranlés par les images des terribles feux de forêt qui sévissent en Californie. Cette recrudescence des catastrophes naturelles confirme l'importance de s'attaquer à l'enjeu des changements climatiques, et ce sur plusieurs champs d'action. Celui de l'électrification de nos industries, de notre économie, à partir d'énergie propre et renouvelable, en est un. D'ailleurs, les panélistes experts aborderont cet enjeu plus en détail tout à l'heure. And now, this is it for your French lesson. I'm switching to English. I am pleased to be here with you today. The subject under discussions and the activities of the New York Climate Week in general address issues that are of great importance, but above all, directly relevant to the current events. We are all very much affected by the images showing the devastation resulting in the wildfires raging in the Western United States and especially in California. Natural disasters such as these remind us of the great urgency of tackling the issue of climate change through several fields of action. The electrification of our industries and our economy through clean and renewable energy is among the most important of these concrete measures. I am delighted to know that expert panelists will have the opportunity to discuss this topic in greater detail later today. The concept of electrification is often associated exclusively to the transportation sector. However, electrification also concerns the application of clean and renewable energy, as well as green technologies to an array of sectors linked to the entire economy. Think of energy efficient buildings, for example. Quebec has grasped the economic dividends that, stand, that can steam from electrification and has taken concrete steps to integrate this into the economic model. From this effort, we have developed a multi-faced expertise that we can showcase and apply on a global scale. Quebec expertise is founded upon abundant natural resources. More than 99% of Quebec's energy production is from renewable sources, hydro, wind, biomass, and we also have tremendous potential for strategic and critical minerals, rare earths, lithium. But this expertise is also the product of strategic decisions and investments. Annual R&D investments in the clean technology sector stand at 300 million Canadian dollars, and we have over a thousand companies and organizations working in clean technologies. It has made us a leader in green business solutions. We are bringing these solutions to the table and want to work with allies and partners to help them reach their own climate goals. Electric mobility is a big step towards reaching those climate objectives. Quebec relies on a network of about 150 innovative companies specialized in this field and more than 600 qualified highly qualified professionals. This industry also earned more than $830 million Canadian in export revenues, showing that international buyers are interested in Quebec-made electromobility solutions. 
In fact, I know that New York has signed contracts with several companies in Quebec in this sector. To name just a few, I can mention Adenergy, supplier of electric ve vehicle charging stations. FNCO, that developed a high-tech hybrid garbage truck. And finally, Boivin, which created a 100% electric truck, meaning 100% of GHG emissions redu in reductions. Another important part of, of the electrification experience, which has enhanced our role as a partner for decarbonization, is our renewable energy portfolio. Quebec's energy supply stands out for its clean and renewable character. In 2019, electricity generation totaled 214 terawatt hour in Quebec, of which 95% came from hydropower, close to 5% from wind power, and the rest coming from a combination of alternative sources like biomass solar energy. Hydro Quebec's Trans Energy Division is solely responsible for the largest transportation network of electricity in North America with 17 interconnections allowing for Quebec's neighbors such as the Northern United States to import clean, renewable, affordable, and reliable energy. It is clean, it is green, but it's not mean. I want to recognize the presence of Boralex with us today and thank them for having organized this panel with the Quebec government office in New York. I mentioned Hydro-Quebec, but Boralex is another big player in Quebec's energy portfolio. Boralex, as Catherine said earlier, is key in five important energy sectors, hydropower, wind, solar, biomass, and energy storage. You will hear much more from Boralex in a few minutes. Let me say a few words about wind energy. Did you know that the first Quebec wind farm was built in 1998 in the Gaspé Peninsula at a time when this part of Quebec was under serious economic duress? Since then, the wind energy industry has energized the regional economy, created a niche of excellence for Quebec technology, and established itself as a source of green and reliable energy. Wind power is also very much complementary to, wind, to hydropower and other types of energy sources that simply allow clients to count on a diversified energy portfolio. The perfect combination to meet GHG reduction targets. We cannot repeat it enough. Renewable energy is good for the environment, but, is, is it, is it, it is, sorry, but it is also good for the economy as well. The energy sector also counts on a network of about 150 Quebec companies, some of which have offices in the United States and are created jobs on both sides of the border. In these difficult economic times, made worse by the global health crisis, it is even more important to invest in innovative sectors that will spur our competitiveness, create jobs and prosperity, and help us honor our joint envi envi environmental commitments. In that regard, electrification and more largely decarbonization are sectors with a promising future. And we should aim to partner up, innovate, and find solutions that will build a sustainable and more prosperous post-COVID economy. Thank you all. And remember that Quebec is your partner for decarbonization and you can count on the support of our offices in the United States. The Quebec government office in New York and its delegate, General Ms. Karine Loubier, are here to help. Thank you, everyone. Merci à tous et bon climate week. Thank you, Minister Giro. Uh, I'm Darren Suarez from Borelex, and I'm going to introduce the, this afternoon's panelists. But during uh, during this panel, please feel free to use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screens to ask your questions. The panelists will be addressing your questions during today's events. So we have an outstanding panel. Pierre-Olivier Pierre, uh, professor at uh, HC Montreal, 
He is an energy policy specialist, particularly in the electric sector. He participates regularly in public debates on energy and has authored many reports on the government and also public organizations. We have Hugues Jordan. He's the vice president of development for Borlex, first with Cascade Energy and then with Borlex. He has over 25 years of experience in renewable energy, and he has actively contributed to Borlex's success over the years by leading major projects uh, such as Senorita de Borlex, which is the currently Canada's largest wind project, and Borlex's recent expansion into New York solar market, including the development of over 180 megawatts of greenfield solar projects. In addition, on the on the panel is Dallas Bertram. Dallas uh, is the uh, Darius. Darius Gaskin, Senior Fellow for, uh, for Resources for the Future. Dallas has worked to promote efficient uh, control of air pollution and written extensively on electrification and the electric industry, uh, both regulations and environmental outcomes. Dallas's current research includes analysis of the distribution and regional consequences of climate policy, the evolution of electric markets, including renewable integration, and the interaction of climate policy with markets. And our panelist for those, I fear that there are nobody who doesn't know who he is. Richard Kaufman is the chair of Generate Capital, a leading financer of, of clean energy projects. He is known also for his work as an adjunct uh, senior research scholar at the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. And in addition, Richard was New York State's first energy czar, overseeing New York State's transformation in energy policy from overseeing the state agencies and authorities, including the Department of Public Service, the New York Power Authority, the Long Island Power Authority, and ICERTA. So without further ado, thank you, Richard, and uh, we look forward to your questions throughout the day. Well, thank you, Darren, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for being part of this conversation. So one of the key features of the Paris Agreement uh, were the commitments given by sub-national actors, companies, and local and state governments. And it's not a great term, actually, sub-national actors. I guess we need some branding help. But since Paris, the role of these sub-national players has only increased. And the benefit of sub-national actors is that they're closer to projects, often have more flexibility than central governments, and need to be more responsive to local concerns. Um, but while subnational actors may be leading the way, one of the challenges is they can be worlds in themselves. It's hard for one subnational actor to know what another one is doing. So we're really lucky today to be able to learn more about the subnational actor, otherwise known as Quebec, and to learn more about Quebec's progress in energy and climate change. And so to get us going, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Pierre Olivier to give us a a quick picture of Quebec's energy picture. Thank you, Richard. So maybe we can um, show up the slides that would help me. I have a few, sli a few slides to set the stage in terms of uh, Quebec energy sector, so we can go directly to the, the second one. Uh, just to locate um, Quebec in the Northeast, uh, no, the second one, so that's one to just one back, please, yes. Uh, so you can see Quebec is at the center of the, the Northeast with uh, New York and New England, uh, south, uh, south of Quebec, Ontario West, and the Atlantic provinces uh, east of Quebec. And Quebec is a relatively small, well, big province in terms of geography, but small in terms of population. We only have like 8 million people, uh, which is uh, less than half uh, New England population and, and more than less than half the New York population. But if you look at the installed capacity, we have a lot of installed capacity in Quebec, 45 uh, gigawatts of uh, installed capacity. And, and the beauty of that capacity is that it's mostly hydropower. So maybe we can move to the next slide, please, where we detail, where, where the, the details of the installed uh, capacity are presented. Uh, Quebec has, as, as you can see, a lot of hydro, more than 40, 
uh, 40,000 megawatts, uh, which is mostly the bulk of its installed capacity. But we have a little bit of biomass, a little bit of uh, natural gas. Uh, we used to have a nuclear power plant that was shut down in uh, 2000, um, 2012. Uh, we're starting the solar PV with a, a small farm uh, being built by Hydro-Québec, and we have some wind. And just to put these numbers in proportion, the, we have twice the wind uh, New York has installed, and we have uh, 10 times the hydropower New York is installed. And something that should be also mentioned is, is the remoteness of the, the, the generation in Quebec. As you can see, Montreal is really uh, south of the province. So there's a black arrow uh, pointing to Montreal, but the bulk of the generating capacity in Quebec is really uh, very uh, up north of the province. So more than 600 miles from the load centers in the south. And, and there are various uh, regions where hydropower is coming. Uh, but what you can see is that it's really remote. So we, we since this, the, 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 the 60s and 70s and 80s, we've been building these transmission lines to bring power south to the load center. And when we look at the distance uh, from Montreal to New York or Boston, uh, New York and Boston are closer to Montreal than the load, the generating centers we are using on a daily basis, which means that transmission for Quebecers is, is not an issue. Uh, when we're thinking about uh, transmitting power to neighbors going to Ontario or, or New England or New York, for, for us, it's not something that is a barrier, uh, conceptual barriers. And we are used to build transmission lines. And of course, we know that there are many uh, political barriers and social barriers to overcome. But just the idea of having transmission lines is something that is part of the Quebec system, and it has been for a long time. Uh, and all the green dots you see uh, along the, the St. Lawrence uh, shore uh, and up to the Gaspésie uh, Peninsula, these are the wind uh, farms that are installed all across, uh, well, all across the south of Quebec. Um, so, so wind and hydro are coming from a lot of different uh, geographical places in Quebec. Uh, Hydro-Quebec is a major player in the Quebec electricity, electricity system. So maybe if we move to the next slide, we'll, we'll get a better sense of the electricity market in Quebec, which is extremely concentrated around Hydro-Quebec and its three main divisions. There's Hydro-Quebec production in charge of generation, uh, then there's the transmission company and the distribution. Uh, no, they are all subsidiaries of Hydro-Quebec, which is a government of Quebec. Uh, well, the ownership is all uh, within the hand of a single uh, owner, the, the government of Quebec. Uh, Generation is not regulated, so there is, uh, it's an open business, so there are private uh, independent power producers and there are some industries that are doing some self-generation in Quebec. But of course, Hydro-Quebec is in charge of most of the generation and I'll show, you, I'll show you some numbers in the next slide. But before going to the next slide, we, we, uh, what connects generation to distribution are, no, we can stay on the, on, on the slide four, is, uh, is the long-term contract. So we don't have, as in the New York or New England or Ontario, uh, uh, a their head market where uh, we have a, where an independent system operator uh, gets the obtain the daily bids uh, by by uh, producers. Uh, we only have long-term contracts between a set of um, producers and Hydro-Quebec distribution that is that has basically, which is horizontally integrated and distributes electricity all over Quebec. So we basically have one distributor for the whole province and uh, Hydro-Quebec distribution is regulated by the local energy board of public utility commissions called the Régie de l'énergie in Quebec. And uh, we benefit from extremely low rates because of the, the historical low cost hydropower that I've shown you some uh, images before. And you can see we're very lucky in Quebec. We have you know, very cheap rates for residential electricity, 5.5 US cents per kilowatt hour. When in New York, it's closer to 23. It can vary across the different uh, counties in New York, depending on the distributor. Uh, but overall, Quebec, all the residential consumers in Quebec and industrial consumers benefit from extremely low rates, uh, which are basically explained by the low cost hydro that is already installed and, and which is linked to the geography of, of, of the, the province. Uh, 
There are some IPPs and industrial self-generation, but Hydro-Quebec remains at, at, you know, at the center and generates most of uh, the electricity. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see that we'll see that uh, you know how sales of Hydro-Quebec are, are, are shared across different subsectors. Um, but what I really want to highlight here is the, the share of Hydro-Quebec sales across the consumption in the province is really extremely high. So 170 terawatt hour of uh, sales for Hydro-Quebec within the province or in a consumption of 196 terawatt hour in 2017. So basically the 26 uh, terawatt hour are uh, industrial uh, self-generation uh, mostly uh, for, for by industrial users that do have their own hydropower plants uh, for their own consumption. Hydro-Quebec exports a lot, around 30 terawatt hour per year. Uh, so we are already contributing to our neighbor's uh, electricity mix. And what has to be highlighted here is the high level of consumption in Quebec, mostly for two reasons because we have electrified a lot of our uh, a lot of usages most most importantly heating in Quebec is uh, is based essentially on on uh, hydropower and that leads to a very high um, per capita consumption around or close to 24,000 kilowatt hour per year per capita including the industrial consumption and of course we have many industries that are uh, high electricity uh, consumers so the per capita high consumption is a mix of uh, electrical heating for most of the Quebecers and industries that came into Quebec to benefit from hydropower uh, availability and low cost. And if we compare to the New York per capita consumption, uh, closer to 7,000 kilowatt hour, we can see the difference uh, that we are huge electricity consumers. And, and of course, prices are uh, a huge part of it because if you have cheap electricity, then of course, that's a, a major incentive to electrify some needs. So, so this is an overview. I'll be happy to, uh, you know, go in more details on some aspects if some uh, if there's a need to or answer questions. But Richard, I'll uh, over to you if um, for that short introduction on the Quebec electricity system. Okay. Well, thank you, Pierre Olivier. So, uh, I'd like to start with uh, <clears throat> with electrification, transportation, and. Um, Mr. Giraud did talk about that's what we first think of. So let's start there. And I'd like, um, uh, you know, when we think about electric vehicles, we often think of that uh, electric vehicles don't do so well in cold weather. And even with global warming, Montreal is not very warm. So I'd like to talk about what accounts for the success beyond just uh, cheap, cheap electricity prices, because I think what we're, what we're interested in this conversation are the lessons that can be taken from Quebec. Not everybody has as much hydro, obviously, and low cost, uh, but what were the things that, that um, helped make uh, electrification of, of, of transportation so successful in Quebec? Uh, Mr. Giraud talked about uh, uh, infrastructure companies that are making export sales, and so, uh, you maybe we can start with your thoughts on this. Sure, I think it's uh, start pretty far off in the history, uh, starting 19. If, if you look at the map that's been uh, that's been showed by uh, Pierre Olivier, you would notice that there's very very few production of uh, renewable energy around Montreal or even Quebec City. I mean, there is some around Quebec City, and we're fortunate to own one of these big ones, but there's it's there's not a few of them. So a lot of investment has been done throughout the. Uh, the area of 1965 and uh, 735 kV line that uh, have become a way for us to capture all this energy from territory and gather it where the consumption center are. And I think the, the other um, key aspect was to do it early in the process. Um, uh, starting in 65 and 70s, uh, the government of Quebec was even having some extra production, which has allowed pretty good tariff, even though at the time, which has triggered construction code to change and allow people to have residential, complete residential houses without ha even having some gas input. I mean, here in Quebec, it's probably tough uh, for you guys to, to see that from, from, from the New York point of view, but most of the household doesn't have any gas entry. So we do 100% of the energy need with, with electricity. 
And this needs, of course, to have pretty cheap liquidity in order to do that. And you need also to have the supply. So this major line has been the key to, uh, to, to success to us to bring this, this major amount of electricity. So I think that's the, that's the cornerstone of, of this. And later on, I, I guess that um, once it was time to develop some smaller asset, uh, Adro Quebec uh, around 1991 kind of realized that uh, if you want to have run of the river, smaller stuff, uh, maybe a state-owned society is not the exact vehicle to do that. So they had the good idea of promoting some program uh, in order to acquire some electricity from uh, run of the river asset from smaller asset. And this is where Genesis, uh, the, the, this is the genesis of Paradex and, and other company like us that start doing our, or learning our energy sector, developing small hydro in Quebec, but also, and I'd like to mention it, we're also active in New York. Uh, we have 87 megawatt down there in operation. And I feel like choosing the right uh, energy for, for, the, for the right thing is, is, was the key to success, but bringing and transporting this electricity and bring it to the consumption center was large investment at the time was something extremely criticized people were putting in uh, question the the reliability of all that stuff but i think over the last 40 years it's been proven extremely reliable uh, we rely on it to heat our house at minus 30 in winter and it works fantastically and we're 100 percent renewable for that uh, for that investment that's been done early in the state, early in the process well in order to create this critical mass of electric vehicles in montreal uh, can somebody talk about how that, how that happened? Were there particular, in addition to low cost energy, were there, uh, were there grants given, uh, challenges by government, where companies had extra incentives? Uh, Dallas, I, I know you have a perspective maybe on, uh, on the role of tariffs. So do you want to jump in on this? Well, thank you, Richard. I'll jump in on tariffs and I and I want to pick up the theme that everyone has been speaking about the importance of electricity tariffs electricity prices for promoting electrification it's sort of a paradox uh, and this is a lesson for the US states and folks from the US that are paying attention to Quebec uh, that it's a paradox that in those regions of the United States where we see the highest electricity prices are those with with frequently the cleanest electricity grid the low the, with the lowest carbon emissions in the regions of the country which have have where the states have the great most policies to promote electrification especially the introduction of electric vehicles i had one slide and if it's available we could put it up uh, can you bring up this one slide if it's not handy i can just go on um, uh, the point was already made that uh, electricity prices in New York and in uh, California are about four times, thank you, four times greater than in Quebec. And this is work by Severin Bornstein and Jim Bushnell at, uh, in California that looks at the difference between the marginal price of electricity and the average social marginal cost. The social marginal cost inc is inclusive of the effects of local air pollution and estimates of the damages from climate change. And so you can see in California and in the Northeast that uh, the this difference is positive, meaning that electricity is priced too high, even compared to marginal social costs, all in marginal social costs, whereas in many regions of the country which have the lowest electricity prices also have the most emission intensive electricity generation. What's really interesting about this is if you couple this with an analysis of where of gas prices and the marginal social damage from gasoline prices, which these authors have gone on to do, you then see it's a two edged sword. We effectively from a society perspective are overpricing electricity and underpricing gasoline. So you can take the slide off now. I think this is the point I wanted to make. And Richard, if I could just uh, elaborate a, a moment more. So uh, it, that a general claim is made that uh, electrification imposes costs to the grids, to the grid. And there, there certainly is an element of truth to that. Uh, but paradoxically, more and more costs are getting shoved into the grid and into the electricity prices that might properly be nested in general funds or paid for in, in other ways. And 
And so when we look at electrification and the costs on the grid, it is true that there are some costs to the distribution network. It is also true that there are some benefits and cost savings for renewable integration because flexible demand enables a, the integration of more and more renewables. It, by flexible demand, I mean things like electric vehicles, electric hot water, um, uh, and space and water heating that um, have an inherent storage capability. So I want to contrast the conventional uses of electricity, which other than in Quebec, most of us are familiar with, which is we, we expect our computer monitor or our garage door to be instant on, to work for us instantly. But uh, electric hot water has a diurnal storage cycle. You can uh, preheat water up to high temperatures and it's available to you for standard use uh, 24 hours later. Uh, electric vehicles have a storage capability of up to a week. That means that when you choose to uh, charge those store thermal or battery storage devices, you can do so at a time that enables the greatest integration of renewables. So uh, in order to facilitate this in the US, there needs to be some investigation of rate reform. Economists have their pref preferred approaches and political perspectives sometimes are smarter than that. But uh, one simple approach would be to explore the possibility of separate metering for electrification of transport, for example, so that uh, uh, you see the true cost of the grid reflected in the prices for uh, electric vehicles. And then you would see, I think, prices for uh, electrification that resemble the costs that, you, that are apparent in Quebec now and which have explained so much of the story in Quebec. Well, so in terms of, just as a follow up here, how much has Quebec been able to take advantage of the storage capability of, of uh, electric heating and, uh, and hot water? Uh, how flexible has the grid uh, been developed? So I think it, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. Uh, uh. I think it essentially remained to capture. That's the interesting point about it. I mean, we, we, the, the new technology and the, the, the way computer are bringing us some flexibility right now will allow us even to go further with that. But right now, peak managing is not something that we actively do in Quebec. So we, we have further improvement that we, we could go there. But one point I'd like to bring that I think is, is a key point for somebody that makes the choice of, uh, of choosing a, a, an electric vehicle today is the fact that once you're fueling your electric vehicle in Quebec right now, you're putting almost 100% renewable energy. So you're really zero tailpipe emission in terms of gas, but you're also zero emission globally speaking, which is not exactly the case everywhere in the planet. At some place uh, you only displace half, uh, three quarter of it. So, and, and right now I think that people that make that type of choice are enthusiasts people that uh, know what they're choosing and they make that choose for environment. And, and I really believe that knowing that you get access to a large chunk of renewable energy once you fuel your car using your plug, that, that's part of the equation. Maybe I could add a few things to that. Is, is on, and maybe you can put back the one of my slides uh, to show the numbers of EVs in Quebec and how it's been increasing in the last years. Um, but but before that, uh, so here, yes, so, so, so here we see really the, the, the actual number of uh, EVs in gray and plug-in hybrid uh, and hybrid vehicles. And in 2019, we had uh, 120,000 of these on the total fleet of 6.6 .6 million uh, vehicles. So although we, uh, you know, there's still a, a small percentage, less than 2% less than of the total fleet, EVs are, are growing. And the key reason behind that is, of course, we've mentioned the, the clean electricity, uh, the low rates, but also the, the Quebec government incentive, there's a $8,000 incentive uh, provided to um, buyers of EVs, uh, which is also, uh, which is adding to the $5,000 incentive the federal government provides for EV buyers in Canada. So in Quebec, we get the biggest uh, monetary incentive for EVs, uh, 13,000 Canadian dollars for, for new buyers. And, and so that also partly explains the, the, the increasing uh, number of EVs we see on, on, on the roads, but still a small percentage. And, and when we look at the total numbers of a vehicle, the fleet is actually growing more quickly than the, the number of EVs. So, so that's, um, that's a paradox that although we do, you know, we do huge uh, support for electrification, uh, we haven't stopped the, you know, the, the, the increase 
is in, in the fleet of regular uh, uh, internal combustion uh, engine cars. And, and that's a challenge that we have to, to tackle. But to go back, uh, Richard, to your storage question, you know, the low price and the availability of a huge amount of storage in behind the dams of Hydro-Quebec uh, partly also explains the fact that Hydro-Quebec didn't have to manage so much uh, uh, behind meters uh, through uh, hot water tanks and EVs uh, storage. So that's definitely a challenge that we'll have to to, uh, to meet in the future and develop the peak management and uh, demand response. But uh, there's 176 terawatt hour of storage within the dams of Hydro-Quebec, 176 uh, hundred terawatt hour. That, that's a lot of energy that can be stored with, behind these dams. And that's unique in the world uh, in the sense that that's a few millions of uh, Teslas and EVs that would be around, um, which have each uh, 60 to 80 kilowatt hour of storage. Uh, there's already a lot of storage in, um, in the dam. So that's how Hydro-Quebec has been so far able to manage demand, uh, but with some additional uses on different peaks, then more flexibility will have to be developed into the system. Okay, that's good. Uh, so, uh, I'm mindful of time, so I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, this electrification of heating. Is it, is it, and, and, and uh, Mr. Giro talked about energy efficiency. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about whether the heating story is the same story as the electric vehicle story, story which is that it's about really inexpensive uh, electricity, or is there, is there something more that has taken place? And, and, and again, I guess I'm a little surprised about energy efficiency because typically when energy prices are low, you would expect uh, not necessarily a very big focus on, on energy efficiency. So, uh, and it seems that uh, there are also a number of innovative companies that are involved in these kind of solutions. So I'd like to talk a little bit uh, uh, about all that. And so I don't know which of you wanna take that set of questions on to get us going. Well, heating development in Quebec were, were really pushed by uh, the availability of hydro uh, and the low cost of, um, of resistive heating. So, so you, know, build, you know, building houses uh, and heating with electricity was, well, to install the system, the heating system, you know, it, it was the cheapest uh, option in the 80s and 90s. Um, compared to gas, of course, now with low gas, natural gas prices in those regions where you still have, well, we, well where you do have a natural gas network, uh, it's not you know, true anymore that electricity is cheaper. Uh, so those who have the natural gas heating may benefit for now these few years uh, from some advantage, but you know, over the last 20 years, electricity was cheaper to install and operate and and it wasn't really a question as you know it was available and hydro quebec was providing the network and the distribution system was designed to have uh electrical heating in in houses so so that you know brought a, a, a overall over time a, a huge benefit in terms of distribution network that is already built for around that and and the low cost help building this uh, the low cost of energy help building you know a transmission and distribution system that is that doesn't add too much to the overall cost. Um, I would I would claim that there's still a lot of energy efficiency that could be done within houses because of the low price uh, and and you know um, heat pump for example are not so uh, popular or well they're increasingly popular but not so uh, the penetration of heat pump can you know is not that important yet. Uh, it will have to increase. Um, and, and, and again, you know, the thermal envelope of building is not designed for uh, uh, fully efficient buildings. And, you know, if we're looking at the improvements we can make, there are still improvements, but it's on the other hand, as you mentioned, there are a lot of companies that are you know, developing uh, new technologies or options to actually better manage. And, and, and that's you know, where the, the future will be. All right, so maybe let's, let's talk about the the uh, innovation culture in Quebec. Uh, Minister Giro talked about a thousand companies that are involved in clean energy. Uh, and she talked about uh, quite a significant investment in R&D. And so uh, you, maybe you wanna 
uh, talk a little bit about this, how this ecosystem got developed and what was the role of government and what was the role of the private sector and how did this all take place? And are there lessons to be drawn from, from the Quebec experience to other subnational actors? Well, I, can, I cannot unfortunately talk about the thousand uh, company, but uh, if, we, if we talk about our own history, I think that the government of Quebec has been pretty good at fostering some long-term plan in order to, what we need in, in fact, in order to be able to invest is long-term previsibility pre pre over revenue flow. We want to see, we want to see how our government are fostering the development of renewable energy. And I think that for any investor, that sees that there's a future for that type of, of energy will necessarily invest. And you'll see some, some of these guys getting success. And that's exactly what happened to us. Uh, while in 1991, we got EPR 91 program being launched by the Quebec and the government of Quebec, everybody got a very clear message that the, on a long-term basis, there was a future for renewable energy uh, on, a, on, a, on the private sector. And us and many other companies have decided to invest uh, over this, this period of time. And I think that's really what's driving the actual dynamic in Quebec. Um, a lot of people by nature are entrepreneurs in Quebec. That's, uh, that's the nature of probably being in a, in a pretty cold climate and uh, being surrounded by a government that really put it at the forefront of, the, uh, of, of its priority. I feel like uh, it, it's a proper environment for innovation. So Dallas, this, this goes, I think goes back to you because I think this is some of the research that you've been doing. When we talk about government policy, what's, what's your perspective on sort of the relative role of, of mandates versus markets? If I can ask you that question and, and to the degree to which you have some perspectives on what Quebec has done, uh, again, that could be lessons to the rest of us. You have to, you're still on mute. It's probably familiar to everybody on this uh, webinar, the phrase that economists will often invoke that if we get the prices right, problems will take care of themselves. The, there's two pr problems with that statement. One is that uh, we don't have time to wait. And secondly, the transition to getting the pricing right is very challenging. So as an economist, I will adhere to the, what I consider to be the fact that prices provide an incentive that go in the direction we want to see. And we see evidence of that in Quebec. But we also just heard on the, uh, in the evidence from the last couple of comments that the prices by themselves have not been sufficient to achieve the outcome that really Quebec, that Quebec itself wants to achieve. So I think that there has really been a sea change in economic thought towards uh, recognition that you, one needs a policy mix Prices are very good at overcoming price barriers, but very often it is not a price barrier that stops technologies from developing. There's innovation challenges, there's network economies, there's a, a huge coordination challenges in the electricity get, grid. As we talked, as I talked about earlier, the need to get tariff reform such that incentives are properly passed through to consumers. So I think it's we we widely understand now that we need a combination of regulations and prices. And in order for this to work, I, th I think the next pushback one encounters is that, well, when there's overlapping policies, it's really inefficient, that one crowds out the other. And certainly we can write down or conjecture a situation where that's going to be true. But it's very often not the case that one crowds out the other. Quite often they work uh, as, as companions. Uh, and uh, since it's, it's noteworthy to again look to California because of Quebec and California's special relationship under the Western Climate Initiative, where they're part of a joint uh, carbon pricing program, cap and trade program, that program uh, implements an important but only a modest carbon price. Uh, most climate policy advocates would say that price is insufficient to drive the kind of technological change we need. And so both jurisdictions recognize that that price is, uh, is complementary, in fact, to technology forcing policies that, that aim at directed technological change in the transportation sector, in the residential sector, et cetera. So the key thing, Richard, to, that, uh, to wrap up is I would say it's very important to imagine the design of these policies in markets and outside of markets such that they complement each other. And uh, I, there's one tangible point I would like to make in closing that the, the image of this, the familiar image to many of the so-called waterbed effect, which is mentioned and talked a lot about in Europe, and I think it deserves increasing attention in North America. The Quebec and California cap and trade programs have a price floor 
and they also have an additional price level at which additional allowances could enter the market if prices were to ever uh, go, go that high. But in between this price floor and this high uh, point at which some additional allowances might enter the market, you have a totally unresponsive supply of emission allowances. So when things like uh, $13,000 subsidies for electric vehicles or uh, all sorts of other policies that promote directed technological change, when they have gain traction and start to have an effect on energy demand and consequently on emissions, the, the almost sole effect over a, a large range of outcomes is to drive down the price in the, in the allowance market rather than achieving emission, real emission reductions. And, so this is called the waterbed effect because you push emissions down in one place and they just pop up somewhere else, just like if you sit on a waterbed. Uh, this has been recognized in increasingly in co policy conversations in Europe and in North America. And it's really interesting to note that the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which you know about well, Richard, and the Northeast is, a, is embracing a policy reform starting in January of 2021, which will introduce an additional price step that applies to 10% of the allowances in their cap and trade program, such that if other co complementary policies drive down the price in the allowance market, a portion of allowances in that market may, may not enter the market and therefore you support the price in cap and trade. So this is one example of a way of designing policies in the, on the pricing side that are truly complementary to the policies that we want to, to drive uh, technological change. Okay, well, you've opened a door here that I'd like others to address, which is uh, going from within a subnational actor to thinking about things on a regional basis, because obviously there are certainly valuable things that we've learned already about what Quebec is doing, but the real leverage goes beyond a single actor to uh, regional action. So, um, uh, Pierre, Olivia, do you want to do you want to start? Then, I'll, then I'm going to go to you. You. Yeah, um, yeah. I think you, you've. I think this is really the, the future for the Northeast is is in both within development within subnational actors, you know, setting up right policies, but there's a huge potential for uh, co-benefits between regions. When we look at the, the goals, the decarbonization goals of New York and REV, for example, that you know very well, 70% uh, of renewable power in New York by 2030, that's a lot of renewable power. Uh, New York already benefits from 10 terawatt hour of uh, hydroelectricity coming from Quebec, you know, on a yearly basis on the spot market, that's the, the, the export, day-to-day -day exports uh, from Quebec. But there, there, there is more than the region could contribute to each of the subnational actors' goal uh, by more collaboration. Uh, by you know, I mentioned already the, the the reservoir and the storage capability within Quebec, 176 terawatt hour of um, of storage capability. And that could be used to build more wind in New York, more wind in New England, in Ontario, in the Atlantic provinces, all that wind, which is variable, has to be uh, balanced by some storage. And we have so much storage in Quebec, there could be you know, a lot of gains for wind penetration in all of these regions if there could be more interconnections between the region. So that's something that you know, really needs um, governments talking to each other to set up the right markets to, to, you know, to value the storage and the energy balancing so that more wind can penetrate these markets. And so that's where really subnational governments have to sit down and think about their goals and the cheapest way to achieve these goals. And I see you know, there's a, there are huge benefits that, that could be reaped if we were discussing in such directions. Well, so I want to follow up just on this point. I understand what you're saying in, in, in concept. Uh, but uh, how big of a technological challenge is it to, to deliver that battery storage when the wind slows down uh, in an adjoining state or the sun, you know, clouds pass uh, over solar panels? Uh, do we have a grid that can really do that on a real-time basis? Well, 
yes, I mean, it's, it's not so much a technological challenge, it's really an institutional challenge in the sense that if you look at countries like uh, Denmark, they, they had like 100% coal system 20 years ago, and now they are 50% wind, and, and, and they can balance their own system with interconnections with uh, Norway, Sweden, Germany, uh, and uh, even the Netherlands. So, so they could really, you know, increase their share of wind from zero to almost 50% in 20 years by building these interconnections and making sure the institutions were able to ma manage uh, uh, the, the you know, variability of wind. So this is something our subnational governments haven't been really working on for the last decade. And, and when we look at the ambitions of New York, New England, uh, Ontario, and the Atlantic provinces, and when we look at the, the storage options that, that is already available, storage you know, by every mean, will be key to have more uh, wind and solar. And, and so, but storage is already there in the region. The lines are there. They're not sufficient to balance everything, but you know, the technology is not the issue. It's really uh, the, the, the infrastructure. Do we have enough infrastructure? And do we, do we have the institutions that allow this kind of uh, balancing? Okay. Luke, do you have thoughts on this? On yeah, I think the uh, as, as you mentioned, technology is already there. I mean, we're talking here about technology that's been proven since, since 1965. Idle Quebec is moving electrons for thousands and thousands of kilometers very reliably. We now even have DC line for the last 30 years, which are proven technology right now that allows us to move energy. And I think it's extremely important because even if you remove the battery from Idle Quebec and you just think about exposing yourself to multiple area, because wind regime are so different from Quebec, New York, and other area of the planet. If you look at where renewable has large penetration, you'll notice that there's one common point. They all are very interconnected network because once it's not windy at one, one point, it might be windy at the other one. So you're kind of adding up uh, some random source and at, this, at, at some point, uh, you, you, you get a way better and more resilient grid if you tie all that stuff together and allow bilateral negotiation and transaction among the, uh, the, the jurisdiction. And, and on the general point of, of, of regional cooperation, the other thoughts you have, I think Dallas maybe wants to talk a little bit more about uh, cap, cap and trade. Uh, I'd like to know how, that, how that's really going with California, which seems very far away. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have opinions about that and I'm glad to elaborate, but I do want to jump on the points that others have just been saying that um, expanded transmission capability is a politically sensitive issue because it's a local political issue, but it is not that great of an expansion of the transmission net network that is needs to be achieved in order to fulfill this vision. Uh, the, an MIT study, which I am fond of uh, a year ago, found that adding four gigawatts of transmission between New England and Quebec would lower the cost for a zero emissions power system by 17 to 28%. And that would require no new hydro capacity construction, which is also another environmentally sensitive issue. And crucial is that this would involve a two-way, as Pierre Oliver was just saying, a two-way exchange of electrons because there's sometimes the wind is blowing in one place, it's blowing in another. So there are times when New York would be, New York or New England would be exporting power to Quebec much of the time that they would be taking power from Quebec. Uh, the, uh, to put that in context, I think, Richard, you would know better than I, but I think that in the last couple of years, well, in, in the next year, I believe one gigawatt of transmission power is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be newly developed and uh, available into the New York, New, New England area. And another in the, the other route, which is still uh, much in discussion is about another gigawatt. So there is really on the table, half of this expansion of transmission capability was effectively in the works. But as Hugh has said, it's really an institutional problem to solve these, pro uh, to overcome the challenges that exist at the local level. Now, now, Richard, you just invited me to just make a quick comment about the California cap and trade program. Um, I am uh, generally a big fan of the California cap and trade program. I think it's the best, the California Quebec program, I should say, is the yeah. best, the best designed program in the world uh, that still has its challenges and its challenges paradoxically are that it is is it is that it's uh, achieving its goals and so this poses a challenge actually a threat to the survival of the program because uh, with the existence of a price floor which is an excellent 
feature in the program design design in some of the uh, quarterly auctions, not all the allowances sell. And so the auction is undersubscribed and this has led to variable revenue that have been coming to the state of California. And I'm not sure how this plays out in Quebec, which has caused all sorts of political disruption because the state has been counting on this revenue to, uh, to uh, fund various programs. Um, and so when I spoke earlier about like the emissions container reserve, which Reggie is putting in place, which is some additional price responsiveness in the supply of allowances in the program, uh, this actually can, by restricting the supply of allowances in the cap and trade program, you can actually grow the revenue that is available under the program, just like, you know, monopolists withhold supply in a market in order to increase overall revenue. And uh, so it's as though policymakers give instructions to the market to go out and achieve the social goal. Well, if it turns out to be cheaper than you thought it was going to be, you might want to achieve, you want, want, might want to purchase and automatically purchase greater emission reductions as a consequence. So what's happening is that we have this, these complementary policies like electric vehicle support or building, pr pr promoting electrification of buildings that are helping us achieve emission reductions. That's all very, very well and good, but we have to think about how we design uh, carbon markets such that they uh, dovetail with that nicely rather than working in opposite directions. Okay, thanks. So we're coming to the end. So I got I have two last questions. So the first question is just, um, which is something that I think uh, uh, subnational actors all wrestle with, which is the relationship with our federal parents, uh, or I don't know if they're parents, but our federal partners, maybe. Uh, it doesn't always feel like a partner, but that's a different story. That's for the next uh, uh, conversation, maybe. But I'm, I'm uh, just curious how, how, first question is, uh, how do these, how do you fit into the overall federal uh, picture in, in, in Canada? And then the second and last question is just as a kind of lightning round, what's the one thing that, uh, again, the one lesson you'd want everybody to take away from Quebec that they can use in their in their own subnational way. Well, I'll start with the easier one, which is that the federal government in Quebec uh, is is not playing a big role because of the constitution. The Canadian constitution really provides all the power in energy in the energy sector to the provinces so so quebec as every other canadian province has a lot of power and can design its own its own market as it wishes um and that's you know that's something that may probably brought a lot of efficiencies in the in the quebec system because you know they could design a very efficient market uh, in terms of Hydro Quebec uh, being vertically integrated and providing supply and uh, low cost electricity to a lot of um, a consumer while you know providing some room for private uh, companies um, you know the one lesson Quebec can provide to the world you know it's if you are very lucky you have a lot of hydropower and a lot of space to put some wind uh, but that's something that cannot be replicated easily uh, and now we need to be able to evolve to make sure that, you know, we'll be ready for the future because, you know, what brought us to where we are now may not be what we need for the next 50 years. And even in Quebec, we need not to rest on our lessons. And I'm sure we, we will be able to, you know, make the system evolve, but we need to have an evolving system, an evolving regulation to open up and to reform uh, price incentives within Quebec to be more aligned with uh, our partners around Quebec. Thank you. Luc? Yeah, I think the um, relation between federal and provincial in Quebec is very, very similar to the one you guys have in US. Um, most of the decisions are being think provincially. Uh, but I, one thing I'd like to remind you, if you remind the, car, the, 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 the map that's been showed by, uh, uh, by Pierre Aguirre a little bit earlier, electrically speaking, Quebec is way closer from the United States than from the rest of the, of the Quebec if we, ex, if we exclude the maritime, which is not a very large consumer. So I guess we're focusing a lot on conveying energy from, from the, the north to south more than from east to west. There's very, very few interconnections right now that are existing between, uh, between uh, the, the east and the west in Canada, uh, probably just because of distance. 
All right, Dallas, you have any final thoughts for us? I do have one. Um, we saw earlier this afternoon from Ms. Deralt and Catherine Vabir uh, a willingness to reach out uh, and to other jurisdictions and try to uh, establish partnerships. And that willingness has been enduring and has uh, uh, trans transported across political parties of whoever's in power in Quebec. There has been this consistent willingness. So I think really success happens by building economic and political coalitions that are gonna benefit from the new regime. Uh, Quebec is well situated to be that leader because there's a lot of enterprise uh, and entrepreneurs in Quebec that could benefit from expanded use of renewables across North America. And I think the lesson here is to really play that and I encourage and welcome Quebec's leadership on the, in North America in trying to develop this industry. Well, with that, uh, this has been a great conversation. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank all of you for participating and for having this deep dive into the subnational actor of Quebec. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, for, uh, Richard, for, uh, for, for everything and uh, for being a, such a great moderator. Thank you for our panelists. And thank you very much, uh, Minister Giro and her staff for helping to facilitate uh, today's event. And a big thank you to Catherine Louvier, the, dele uh, the Delegate General of Quebec in New York. She and her staff have done amazing work putting together so many different panels uh, throughout the week. And if you're interested in the quality and of, of this panel and you're interested in seeing more, tomorrow uh, the Quebec delegation will have two more panels, one on uh, carbon neutrality and higher education, one on decarbonizing the downstate grid. And that'll be at noon tomorrow. And on Friday, they'll also be in a discussion uh, we touched upon it today, which is electrification and transportation. For all of you that uh, may have missed or were interested in sort of returning to parts of today's discussion, know that everything will be recorded today and it will actually be on the Climate Week uh, website. So look forward to, to having an opportunity to revisit today's discussion. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.